Amen. Well, I'm going to let you be seated for a moment. And I'll read my text in just a minute. Scott Fedor was a vice president for sales and marketing, a large company. And as a result of his income and his success, his career was on an upward path. And he was living the American dream until he made a decision one day and he went to his lake house. And as he had done before, he had gone out to the pier and he dove in to the lake. Didn't realize that there had been a dry season and the lake had dropped two feet. His head hit the bottom of that lake and his neck broke in a high place. He couldn't move. He couldn't do anything. He was face down. He was going to die. The dog went wild seeing what had happened. And the dog alerted the family. The family came out and rescued him from death, brought him to the trauma center. And the doctor gave him the terrible prognosis that you will never walk again, you will never breathe on your own again, you will never move again because your uh, spinal cord has been severed at a very high level. And he lived in the state of Michigan. This took place in the state of Michigan. Now, Michigan has a law that allows patients to make the decision to give permission to the doctor to kill them. Michigan has a law that allows the doctor legal authority to take your life. And so the doctor was going through all the list of the prognosis and said, you're never going to do this. All, for all practical purposes, the life you once knew is completely over. And really what was happening in Scott's mind up to that particular point is that he wanted to die. He, he was trying to figure out, how can I kill myself? I don't want to live like this. But when the doctor then looked at him and said, you'll never walk again, and now I have to ask the question, do you want to live or do you want to die? And he said, Scott said that when he made that statement, something welled up on the inside of me, and I said, yes. I want to live. And of course, he, he's writing a book and he's traveling all over the world and he has to have assistance and he's still living with his handicap. But he said, you know what? I had rather have hope than despair. And I'd rather live with my disability with enthusiasm, knowing I can still have significance and make a difference with my testimony, even though I can't change my circumstance or what's happening in my life. And so you know what, church? I just think during this Christmas season as we move into the new year, what about it? What about it? What about it? I know some of you want to give up. Some of you are struggling. Some of you want to quit. Some of you got, you know, you got a little tear in your eye and you got a little trouble in your life. You don't even have half the trouble that Scott did. And I just want to know, is there something on the inside of you? Is there something on the inside of you that says, yes, I want revival. Yes, I want a move of the Holy Ghost. Yes, I want to make it. I want to make a difference. Yes. Yes. Can anybody say yes in this place? So here's, here's my thing. Here's my thing during this Christmas season. Now, you can do what you want to, and if you want to lay there and die, that's, I guess, your choice. But I'm just not going to make that choice because I believe that there's something else that God's wanting to speak to us. I'm going to possess the promises of God. They're there for us. They're in the Word, and I'm going to claim them. I choose the spirit of Joshua and Caleb that says we're well able to take the land. I don't want to preach to sad people tonight. You might be depressed, but I'm not going to leave you depressed because I want you to decide in your spirit who you are and what you're about. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 6. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, 
The land which we pass through to search it is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delight in us, then he's going to bring us into the land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them. And here it is. The Lord is with us. Fear them not. Isaiah 53 and 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? So here's what I want to talk to you about. I want to show you. I, I don't want to fuss at you if you have the wrong report. But I want to show you how to craft your own report and not just live off of somebody else's report. You know, we sing that song, whose report will you believe? I will believe the report. But I want to know what is your report and how do you craft that report, especially when you're going through a very difficult time. How do you possess the promise and you focus your mind and your thinking on the God's purpose and you learn how to craft your own report? That is a key for every one of you in this service tonight. All 12 spies saw exactly the same thing, but they brought back different reports. Joshua and Caleb had the spirit that says we are well able to take the land, to see God's promise fulfilled. We must learn how to craft our own report. To possess his promise, you got to pursue it. you got to pursue his plan. You only receive what you pursue. Whatever you have right now, you are there because of a multiple choices you made of what you are pursuing. Your pursuit has determined your destiny and you are exactly where you are by what you have pursued in your life. That's the reason why we come to church and we preach to get you to pursue the right thing. That's the reason why I want you to read your Bible every day. Choose that place, choose that time, and then write in your journal. It's in that journal you craft your message. This is what I've learned from David. You don't wait till you face the giant to try to craft your message because the giant will change your message. But I guarantee you, if you learn how to craft your message before you meet your giant, then your giant's going to find out the power of a true message that comes from God. And when the giant finds out he can't change your message, he can't depress you enough, he can't defeat you enough, he can't mess with you enough, you still believe in truth. You still believe in the word of the Lord. No matter who don't believe it, I still believe it. No matter who doesn't have it, I still desire it and I hunger for it. And even if I don't have it as much as I would like to have it, I know it's Christmas season, people of this, people of that, people are into gifts, people are into eating too. I mean, I have gotten more junk food and more fudge and more cookies. Listen, folks, I've got plenty and I'm not eating any of it. I have already declared I'm going to fast all of that sugar because I will absolutely, you think I'm wired tonight? My goodness. I would be bouncing off of the wall. Oh, but I guarantee you it's a wonderful season. But listen, I'm pursuing what God has promised this church and every one of you. I'm pursuing the blessing of the Lord on every one of you. I am pursuing the blessing of the Lord in 2022. I am pursuing abundance for every individual in this house. I am pursuing the victory for to overcome your fear, to overcome your pain, to overcome your attitude, to overcome your outlook on things so that you can rise above it and you can walk through it and come out on the other side. I will not sympathize with the weak. I will not sympathize with those who have made their own bed and their own choices. But I desire is anybody here that says, when the doctor, when the devil comes to you and say, do you want to die? You say, no, I want to live. 
When God says, do you want to live? I say, yes. Amen. Amen. There's always going to be somebody that's not going to trust God's word. No matter what God promises, no matter how good it is. Because every promise is conditional and you got to respond in faith. Your outlook is going to determine how you act and what choices you make. And how you see things is going to determine what choices you make. If you've got an attitude of faith, then you're going to pursue God's plan for your life. Even though that plan has a price and that plan can hurt and be painful at times. And those who lack faith, they will not pursue. They will not reach. They will not seek. They will not knock until the door is open. But if you'll possess God's promise and you'll pursue it by faith and say, I'm going to make diligent search, as 1 Peter 1.10 declares, I'm going to seek him with my whole heart. I'm not going to wait till the new year or a more favorable season or a more favorable time. I'm going to seek the Lord now, and I'm going to do it with my whole heart. Acts 17, 27, we're to seek him because he can be found. I was on a mentoring call with Liverpool, England this afternoon, and it was so exciting to hear their pastor and his two sons that were online with me, uh, and we were doing the Zoom call, and, and, and they were so excited about what God's going to do in the new year, and you know how England is. They're socialist, and their government's very controlling, and, and, and lock down this, and they'll lock down your mama. They'll lock down everything. They'll lock down anything they can lock down. They'll find a new lock to lock everything down. That's the kind of attitude they have. Uh, and just, just even start talking about a variant. There's always another variant, isn't there? They got to sell more vaccines. There's just got to be another variant. But anyway, be that as it may, they're in, but they said, Brother Kinsey, we're, we've had a breakthrough. We're having revival. And all of a sudden, they started talking my language. I believe we're going to double this next year. We're going to double our church. They've got five churches started right now. They said, I want to run 200 in every one of those churches by the end of next year. I said, it can happen. It can happen. I'm going to pursue it. I said, I'm going to pursue it. You say, well, it may not happen. Well, what if it doesn't happen? Well, at least I've pursued it. If I go to judgment, I'll at least go to judgment saying I'm looking for God to bless somebody. It's time to seek the Lord now. You don't need to wait for a more favorable season. You need to seek God now. You need to worship now. You need to bless the Lord now. So what you messed up your life because you're, you're ignorant. Go ahead and praise him and say, I'll repent and turn around and I'm going to walk with God and do what's right in his eyes. I'm not saying these promises don't have challenges. I'm not saying that you don't have challenges. I'm not trying to compare you to Scott Fedor. I'm not trying to compare you to this dude that had this overwhelming desire to live, even when just moments before he was thinking about killing himself. I'm not trying to compare your situation and belittle your pain or belittle your crises, because everybody here is in crises. Some of you look like you're in crises. And, and you've been looking that way for a long time. Bless your heart. I don't know if you're creating your crisis or you just enjoy it. Uh, some people enjoy crises. They enjoy chaos. They enjoy problems. I don't know what they get out of it, but they just like to stir things up. You got anybody like that in your life? They just stir it up. I mean, they, they just... It doesn't make any difference if it's going good. They got to find something to stir up. I don't want to live like that. I don't want our church to be like that. I want us to walk in the blessing of the Lord and in victory. Every promise has its problems. But if you're going to get the gift of the Holy Ghost, you're not going to get it just sitting there. You got to seek after it. If you want the pearl of great price, then you got to make a sale. You got to sell it all to purchase it. Now, how many of you will admit your greatest problem is within yourself? Wow. Well, there's a few of you that's going to make heaven. The rest of you are gone. I mean, it's, it's, it's over. 
How many of you will admit to me that your greatest problem is within you? Well, a few more have just decided to come on and, and say, you know what? If this is a heaven or hell issue, it is. <laughs> Maybe I need to join up on this one. Hallelujah. You mean to tell me that I am my own problem? I, the person you're sitting next to is not your problem. They are a problem. But they're not your problem. They're their own problem. I, I can fix every marriage in this house, every conflict and relationship in this house if you'll do one thing. Work on your ignorant self and leave everybody else alone. I wish somebody would just jump up and start saying amen. Work on yourself. Fix yourself. Quit fixing everybody else. Here, here's some problems that everybody has that has to be worked on continually if you're going to possess the promises. First of all, your perspective on life is a constant problem because it's constantly being challenged by negative voices that speak to you. Voices within the church, voices within your family, voices that mean well, people that say God told me, people that are saying I'm in the Holy Ghost and they wouldn't know what the Holy Ghost was if it moved on them 10 days in a row. Huh? I mean, I, I've, I've seen it. I've seen, I'm, I've been in church all of my life. God told me. God ain't said nothing to them. They just ate too many of them cookies, praise God. And they're upset about something. And I understand the, the strong emotions that come when you've got problems and you are upset about something. But just because you've got a strong emotion, that strong emotion is not necessarily the voice of God. And you've got to recognize that. So when you get all these voices speaking to you, it can change your perspective on things. That's why I want you in that word. Not just when you come to church, but every day, every day, every day, as Sister Vesta Mangan would say, every day, every day, every day. And if anybody tries to come around and change your view of yourself, your problems come when you see yourself as a grasshopper and you see the enemy as a giant. And when you've got people trying to change your perspective and your view of yourself, they are always the voice of the devil. Quit trying to let people shape your view of yourself and find out what the Bible says about who you are. Find out what Jesus says about you. You belong to someone who's more powerful than anybody else. Don't let your mama or your daddy tell you who you are. Let the Bible tell you who you are. Because the word of God has power to shape that view. And even Pentecostal people, and they're, they're well-meaning, but they have limiting beliefs about God. They feel like that they know more about God than everybody else, but in, in truth, as you step back and you look at what they believe about God, they don't know beans about God. And, and, and here's another one of those big problems that a lot of us have. We bind God to our past experiences. That God can only work the way you've seen him work or you have felt him work in the past. If that's true, then you're your own God. Because I promise you that God is bigger than anything I've ever experienced. And if he showed up here in full force, none of us would survive it. But I thank God he limits his own power. The Bible says he hides his power in Habakkuk. 
Mm, I feel like preaching now. He hides his power, but yet there are times when he will reveal himself. And it'll even wake up sleeping disciples on a Mount of Transfiguration. The Bible says they were asleep. But when his glory began to manifest, and when they were awake, they saw the glory. I wish somebody would wake up and see the glory of God. God's not limited to your experience. And God's not limited to your limited viewpoint of him. So that's why I want the word to dictate to me who God is and what God can do. Now, when I start reading the book, it starts blowing my mind because I can't even wrap. And, and I've, got, I've got a big imagination. I mean, my imagination is wild. I mean, it, it's just like, wow. I can just, I can think big. I can think big. But when I get into the word, the Bible says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all, oh, woo, all oh, I can ask or think. I wish somebody would get a hold of that word right there. You hadn't even thought it big enough yet. You hadn't even asked big enough yet. You haven't even believed big enough yet. Your God is bigger than anything you could ever imagine. He is bigger than your problem. He's bigger than your crisis. Amen. So you've got to learn, if you're going to craft a report, you've got to learn how to, to create it. And Jesus told us how to do it. And, and he did it in a text that you won't recognize unless you understand what the Bible is saying whenever his disciples came back with the great report of all the things their ministry was doing. And, uh, man, we healed the sick, and we raised the dead, and we cast out the devils. Whoa! Hallelujah. We're rejoicing, and they were shouting and praising God because everywhere they went, they had all kind of results. But your report can never be connected to your results. Ever. If you do, when you have an off day, your report changes. Or when God decides he wants to do something else, like develop your character rather than stroke your ego. Oh, <laughs> did I say something wrong? Oh, it's Christmas time, I know. And, and if you want God to, to really show up with power, sometimes he shows up to develop the character and not stroke the ego. So this is what Jesus said. If you want to do this right, don't rejoice in your results, but rejoice that your name is written. And that refers to relationship. I've got a relationship with God that no matter what my results are, I'm still a son of God. Oh, church, I feel, I feel something coming on me right now. Don't you ever let anybody change your opinion of your church because you're not seeing this result or that result or the result that came out of their imagination and quit letting people tell you you're not this and you're not that because you're not all that in a bag of tater chips. That's nothing but the devil. That's nothing but flesh and the devil using flesh. That's all that is. So what you need to do is get back to the book and say, I am a child of God and my name is written and I will rejoice in my relationship with God. Woo! And yes, if I've got a connection with God, the eyes of the blind are going to be open. The deaf ears are going to be unstopped. Yes, yes, yes. I want to live. Yes, yes. So you got to push through your problems. See, that's the reason why press through your problems. You got to be like the woman touching the hem of the garment, pressing through the crowd. You got to get through the press. And so you got to press sometimes through your problems because the problems will cloud your judgment. And, and problems are not always a sign you're not in the will of God. Sometimes they are. But you got to learn to be honest with yourself or God won't be able to speak it to you. Huh? 
and then have me to come up and tell you you're out of the will of God when you think you're in the will of God. Going to be a hard day for me because you're not going to hear it anyway. Because most of the time I have found when people come up and say, if you see anything in my life, yeah. And if I do, <laughs> what's that going to do? My relationship with them changes automatically because that's not even worth the paper it's written on. Really, it isn't. You've got to, in other words, you need to be submitted to the voice of God and let God tell you when you need to correct things in your life. Now, how many of you know God's promised you eternal life through Jesus Christ? All right, rejoice in that. Craft that report. I'm going to live forever one day, and I'm going to see Jesus. How many of you know that the gift of the Holy Ghost has been promised? By the word of God, it is a promise of the Father. It is not just simply something that is extra. It is the promise of the Father that he would baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Do you have the Holy Ghost? Woo! If you've got the Holy Ghost, then let that be your report. I've got the Holy Ghost at fire and it's keeping me alive. I've been baptized in his name. My sins have been washed away. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And don't you let any devil from hell come and change that view of who you are. Amen. So, I remember one lady, I, I've heard, I've told this story a hundred times, but I'll say it one more time. It's just a cool story. They were messing with D.L. Welch trying to change his opinion of what was happening in the church because there wasn't much shouting going on. And he just looked at her and then with his little hand just shook it right in her face and said, well, you can start anytime you want to. And that's exactly what I'm saying. Whenever you think that it's not happening like it ought to be, then you can start it any time you want to. You say, well, we need more worship. Well, get up out of your chair and start doing it. And you know that if you do, about 15 people around you is going to drop dead because they're going to say, my God, they moved. They actually moved. Hallelujah, this must be revival. Then they'll start moving. Then you'll start moving more. I love it. Quit allowing people to change your view of things just because it's not happening the way they've experienced it or the way they, I, I know one of the limiting things, especially when I first started uh, as an evangelist, one of the problems in Pentecost and the reason it was difficult to get some people prayed through in churches is because everybody attached a certain experience or expression of worship with the Holy Ghost that wasn't biblical. The only sign, according to the word, is speaking with other tongues. Now, they, I remember when I laid out on the floor for three hours. Have you ever laid out? If I laid out on the floor for three hours, y'all would have to take me to the hospital. <laughs> Unless it's a supernatural cushion underneath me. And that can happen. I'm, I'm not saying God can't do that. But that's not necessary for you to claim the Holy Ghost. But when I repented, I wept for an hour. That's because you sinned so much. <laughs> I mean, I had to correct all these things in people's mind because they had all this connected to the Holy Ghost that wasn't biblical. No wonder we couldn't get in. Nobody's going to get the Holy Ghost the way I prescribe. They're only going to get the Holy Ghost when I preach the Word. The word is the only thing powerful enough to activate the promise. You can't do it. Well, I've, I've laid hands on them like this. I don't care how much you wave your hands. You can't fill anybody with the Holy Ghost. But while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. Somebody needs to hear this message tonight. Get all your expectations off of God, all your limitations, your concepts. Amen. 
We were a part of the movement to, to change and start allowing gifts to operate again in Pentecostal churches because they shut it down in the latter rain. That's how old I am. Now, the latter rain, I, I ain't got time to explain all that, but that happened before I came along. But its debilitating effect continued into my early ministry. And so we had to change all that. We had to get our thinking straight so that gifts can operate. I still believe gifts ought to operate. I'm pursuing it. I'm pursuing it. J Jesus promised in Philippians 1, 6 to finish what he started. That's what he did. In Philippians 4, 13, he promised that we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. In Philippians 4, 19, he promised to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. In Hebrews 13, 5, he promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Oh, and if that's the promise of the Lord, then I want it and I'm pursuing it. That means that God doesn't come in and out of my life. He may walk in and out of yours, but he don't walk in and out. He abides in my life. That means when I wake up in the morning, even if I'm having a bad day, he's still there. And he might have to deal with my attitude, but he's still there. God don't walk in and out of our lives just because of our emotions and our perspective. That's not the word of God. When you've got my, when you got the word of God, that means that he's with you continually. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'll finish what I've started. And some of you need some finishing work. You know what I mean? Some of you got moved in before you got the molding on the floor. And some of the floor ain't done. And some of the paneling ain't up. So you need to get the, get the Lord working in your life to finish what he started. Some of you got attitude. You don't have any joy. You have no peace. That means God needs to work in you. Because there's no such thing as the people of God not having joy and not having peace. And everybody in this house needs to start rejoicing in the Lord. Everybody needs to rejoice. Rejoice. What, what does the Bible say? This is book. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Oh, somebody, I heard it. I heard it. I heard it. Somebody stand up and say it. Rejoice. Rejoice. You got it. You got it. Go on. I'm not going to rebuke you. Rejoice. I'm not going to ask you where it's at. Rejoice. <laughs> it's only two words and you still can't find it. Praise God. Bless your heart. Yes, because you're not reading. You need to read. <laughs> you need to get in the word. Rejoice. Come on. You got the answer. It's always, all right? Quit acting like, oh, my God. I don't know what the answer is. I don't want to be embarrassed. Rejoice. Rejoice. That means now, tonight, on a Wednesday night, somebody rejoice. You're saved. My report is connected to my relationship, not my results. If we put too much stock in our own thoughts and feelings, we hinder the work of the Spirit. And he cannot lead us if we put too much in our carnal thinking. God reveals the treasures of his provision, his power, and his purpose if you'll seek him. But you've got to hunger and thirst until you're filled. You must make God say, I want a report. That's really good. Making the most important thing in your life. Not results, not blessings, not if God answers your prayer He's got to be the most important thing in, in my life. You might have pain tonight, but if he's the most important thing, that pain can't change your message. And if I can get your message to be able to be consistent with the word, we can take that word and put it on that pain and watch it be healed, Sister Greta. Amen. God healed her the other night, and I'm going to claim that miracle in Jesus' name. If he's promised to finish, if he's promised that we can do all things, if he's promised to supply all of our needs, and he's promised to never leave us, then there ought not be a single perspective in this house that would alter that report. That report is due to my relationship that I have the name. Do you realize, church, you have the name of God Almighty on you? 
You are not just any church. You're not just any people. You are the people of the name, the name of Jesus. You know the creator's name. Tommy Carlisle lived back in the time of the French Revolution. And he was a historist that lived during that time. And he was probably one of the brightest minds of his day. He was a Scottish philosopher, essayist, and a translator and historian. He even dabbled in mathematics, invented a method for solving all kinds of equations. And he began his most comprehensive, his best work, and that was he wanted to make a history of the French Revolution. For two years he toiled. Now, back then, you didn't have one of them computer things, and you couldn't save it to an SSD drive or even to a floppy disk. They didn't even have floppy disks back then. They didn't even have eight tracks. If you wrote anything, you wrote it down. And so the maid who came in to clean his house mistook his manuscript after he had finished it. Took him two years to write it as just nothing but scrap paper and used it for kindling and burn it up in the fireplace. Now go shout on that. And, and, and Uncle Tommy was just absolutely messed up over that. He was so depressed. He was walking around, hanging the lip. My, how in the world? I can't even think about having to start it all over again. And then all of a sudden, he was walking down the streets of the city where he lived. And he, he was crushed. He was depressed. But he saw this bricklayer starting this big wall, making bricks and putting that wall up and taking one brick. And so he would, he would go by there again the next day and there was a little more done. And then the next day, there was a little more done. And then the next day. And then before you knew it, the wall was built and it was done. And it was one brick at a time. And I don't know if there's any bricklayers. Maybe there's a better, faster way to lay brick than one brick at a time. I, I really don't know. Is there all you construction people that are in the house? Can I get a witness? I mean, y'all do know. What, is it still one at a time? I mean, there's no little automated robot now. They can't punch it into their Apple computer app. And then, and then all of a sudden, like they do, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the, the filmmakers can make it build it real fast to speed the film up. There's no speeding the film up. It's still one brick at a time. And he, and he said, all of a sudden, he felt something on the inside of him rise up and said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rewrite my manuscript. <laughs> Fire the maid. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> rewrite my manuscript. Put it behind lock and key, dummy. Huh? Rewrite, I'm going to do it one day at a time. I did one day, one page. In a few years, he had his, his manuscript. It was that manuscript that sparked Charles Dickens and moved him to start writing. And he wrote A Tale of Two Cities. My, my, my. Because your persistence... Now, here's what you need to understand. If you'll possess the promise, if you'll stand up and say, I want to live, you're going to become like Thomas. It's not just going to be that you get to complete the work of whatever God wants to finish in your life. You're going to be an inspiration to somebody else that needs that inspiration at a time when they're depressed, when they're down. You got the testimony I was messed up. I was depressed. I felt like it was all over. But I came to an old-fashioned altar. And I said, God, if you kill me, you kill me. But I want to live. Yes, I want to live. Woo, hallelujah. And so I'm asking First Pentecostal Church, don't do it for yourself. Do it for the generations around you that are going to be inspired. 
Sister Patty's back there lifting her hands, praising and worshiping God. I called her on the phone. She said, Brother Kinsey, the only thing I hate is I hate missing church, but I'm so messed up I can't come. But now she's back. What inspiration that ought to be to everybody. Woo, hallelujah. Sister Joanne Welch, she's here tonight on a Wednesday night. We would forgive it if she didn't come on a Wednesday night. But she said, every time the doors are open, if I can make it, I'll be there. Why? Because that's what we were taught. That's what inspires. That's what influences. Is somebody that says, yes, I want to live. I want to be delivered. I want to be made free. I want to be what God wants me to be. In spite of my dysfunction. In spite of my pain. In spite of my mess ups. In spite of everything I'm not. And I don't have the results that you think I ought to have right now. Huh? I'm still a child of God. Anointed of the Holy Ghost. Baptized in Jesus' name. And there ain't nothing you can do to change that. Because it's written in a book you can't get to. And you can't use it for kindling in the fireplace. No thief can steal it. No maid, dummy, can burn it. Amen. So, that inspiration needs to come to you. Church, let's possess the promises. Craft your message before you meet your giant and craft it connected to the relationship with Jesus. Let's all stand. Musicians, please come. You see, I just decided a long time ago I was either going to enjoy preaching or I was going to quit because there ain't no sense preaching mad or sad or depressed. I've got friends, and I love them dearly, but they can't preach unless they're mad. I mean, that's the truth. They got to be mad at somebody. They got to be mad about whatever it is they're mad about. And I thought if that's, now there's times a righteous indignation rises up in all of us, but do you have to be mad 24 seven? Man, the Bible says the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. I mean, that's the book. That's not Brian, that's the book. So if you got to be mad every time, then something's wrong. Huh? There's just something wrong with your head. So I'm not going to preach mad or sad or depressed. I'm going to enjoy it. Now, y'all may not have enjoyed tonight. Tonight's Wednesday night, and y'all, I, I get it. I get it. You're fine. I'm not going to rebuke you. But I sure did enjoy preaching to y'all. <laughs> yes! I want to live! Hallelujah. I want to live, and I want you to live. Yes, I want you to be blessed. Now, if you want the blessing of the Lord, I want you to come up here and start claiming it in Jesus' name. I want you to speak it and decree it. I want you to come and say, I am blessed, and I receive the blessing of the Lord in my life. I receive it so I can be an influence, so I can bless somebody else. So I can bless Ralph and I can bless Brother Herring and Brother Strobel. So I can bless all of you in this place. I want you to be blessed. I want you to be blessed. I want you to be helped of the Lord. I want you to be strengthened in the, the might of God. I want you to walk in victory. I want you to know who Jesus is and I want you to be able, we're gonna see results. You can't help but see results when you're in relationship. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. 
Let the Holy Ghost move on you right now. So here's what I want you to do. I just want you to lift your heads and be thankful in this holiday season of all the things God has done. Knowing this, my report is he'll finish what he started. My report is, oh, this is my report. That what God has started, he's going to finish. That's what I claim right now. It belongs to you, church. Claim it. It don't belong to me anymore than it does to you or you anymore than it does to me. But it belongs to only those who pursue it and decree it and declare it. Oh, yes. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I bless your life. I bless your family. I bless your finances. I bless this church. Oh, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can get it tonight. If you're not baptized in Jesus' name, we'll baptize you tonight. We'll take care of everything. I'm a child of the King. I am blessed of the Lord, and I will find others to bless, and I will bless those around me with the word of the Lord, with whatever God asks me to do. I will bless, for that is what I've been chosen to do. I will bless. Decree it, church. I decree that I'm a child of the King. I am a son of God. I decree I am washed in the blood, filled with the Holy Ghost. I rejoice in my relationship with Jesus Christ. I rejoice. I rejoice. So, as you leave tonight, find somebody, at least, I would say at least seven people. I mean, I like that number seven. 
It's a number of perfection. And then that kind of gives you, you got to really be more intentional to get seven. You can get, do three real quick. I could have said three and being easy on you. But it's Christmas time, man. Do, this, do seven. There was only three wise men, but we need seven people to bless in here. I don't know how many shepherds there were. So turn to somebody and bless them. Shake their hand and bless seven people. Be intentional about it. I bless you, Barbara, in Jesus' name. Arthur, I bless you. Megan, I bless you. Anthony, I bless you. Ed, I bless you. Dennis, I bless you. Brother Herring, 